Good afternoon and welcome to all of you who have joined us at, here at the Loud to Sea Research Institute. My name is Celia Dudin Drummond, uh, Director of the Loud to Sea Research Institute at the University of Oxford. Welcome to this event. It's the first of a new series called the Down to Earth, Earth Dialogues. Welcome. This is the first of, the, of these series. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented many challenges to all of us. As a global society, we, find, we have to find new ways forward. Academic thinking and research are providing many ideas and tools that will help us do that. But how practical are these? And this is the nub of our questions. Do they answer the questions being asked by those affected? ground or not? How can they be optimized for the concrete challenges we are facing today? Our aim is to address these questions. How? By bringing cutting-edge academic thinking into conversation with organizations, working with affected individuals and communities. And I'm delighted to present our first two dialogue partners to get today. First, we welcome Augusto Zampini Davis. Augusto is currently serving as an adjunct secretary for the Dicastery of Promoting Integral Human Development of the Holy See. He served in different parishes and institutions in Argentina and England and has taught and lectured in various universities, including the Margaret Beaufort Institute at the University of Cambridge. He's also a regular contributor to mainstream and Catholic media. Augusto, welcome. I'm also delighted to welcome Christine Allen. Christine is the director of CAFOD, the Agency for Overseas Development. Christine has held leadership positions at two faith-based international development organizations for the last 17 years. Most recently as the director of policy and public affairs for Christian Aid. Before that, she worked in the area of housing, poverty, social exclusion in the UK as head of public affairs at the National Housing Federation and Education Department, coordinator of the Catholic Housing Aid Agency. Christine, welcome. And the event today has been put on by the Loud Odyssey Research Institute. And just a few words about what we do. I think it's important to say, first of all, that our main goal as a research institute is to reconcile intellectual wisdom and the wisdom of religious in religious traditions for societal transformation and we affect that change through partnerships in higher education faith communities civil society organizations and public policy a few housekeeping matters before we begin the event will last 45 minutes in terms of program we'll hear a little from each participant in turn followed by a period of dialogue between them and towards the end of the event, there'll be a chance for questions from the audience. Please write these in ask a question section at any point during the event. If someone else has already suggested your question, just click on vote and this will raise the priority of the question and ensure you get to it first. The event's been simultaneously live streamed on the Institute's YouTube and the video will be available afterwards if you'd like to rewatch. So, and now I hand over to Augusto, to Father Augusto, to the subject of thinking creatively about the future. Thank you, Celia, and, and thank you, everyone. If I may share the screen. So um, just a, a, a brief introduction of what we are trying to do from the Vatican from this commission that the Pope has created to respond to the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, that gets on top of the climate crisis and the economic crisis, mainly the, the, the great divide or the inequality. And, um, and how, to, how do we propose dreams, actual dreams, in order to respond to the nightmares that we're facing in the 21st century, uh, including the one that during the COVID-19 the, the billionaires have, uh, the, the, the wealth of the billionaires has raised like 10.3 trillion 
while everybody is struggling. So this reveals how the, the broken is, the system is. So what we are trying to, to, to do to connect, to respond to this interconnected crisis is to take, to take them as an opportunity to create something new. And, uh, and, uh, can you hear me? Yep. So, to, and, and to create something new, uh, we, have, we, we are working between different departments of the Vatican quite closely with the local churches worldwide, with uh, partners all over the world, such as well, the Oxford uh, Laudato Si Research Institute. And, and after a while, we have discovered four pillars uh, that, that the research can, can help uh, in, with uh, the, the actors uh, of, uh, uh, of actual development. No? Uh, one is about the dignity in work and the jobs for the future today. So millions of people have lost their jobs. Today is the time to find the new jobs for the future, not in 2021 or, or advanced 2021, so, but today to move towards this just transition in creating jobs for people, but jobs that can uh, take care of the planet. The second is from one to many, new structures for the common good, to go out from the individualistality, whether it's personal or national uh, or religious, uh, towards really to create structures for the common good. For example, the vaccine. No? And we cannot do that without proper governance, peace and security. And so we need to work in, in, in creating a new multilateralism and rebalancing something that we have detached, which is the social systems with the ecosystems. So around these pillars, we are creating lots of projects, concrete projects, not, not me, not our team, but with our partners. I will mention very briefly just three. One is, if we want a vaccine to be really effective, we have, we need, it needs to be for all. But if we want universal vaccination, we need to think holistically in the vaccine. Everybody's excited because of the component one vaccine. Hold on a minute. The vaccine is how do we manufacture it and how the research, where and who is producing the vaccine, how it is distributed, how is, who is going to implement it. And for example, does the vaccine need refrigeration? Because if, if it does, well, half of the population in Africa won't get it. And if get it and we would need a new vaccine and the COVID-19 pandemic will prolong unnecessarily. So these are the things and, and who is going to, to, to hold the vaccine? Is it too costly? Would it be available for the poor or not? So we really want are working on the vaccine for all, which is a holistic understanding and not just a health issue. It's a political, it's an economic, it's a trade issue and it's a religious because sisters in the south, uh, the people trust them. And, if, if, and they won't be vaccinated by anybody. So this is one of the things that we are doing. Happy to discuss it further. Another, the second thing, I mentioned only three, is around food. If you think about people, food is, the, the, the coronavirus has disrupted the food, the supply chain uh, production and distribution. So for example, think about the people who cannot the, get into the, the cruise, who cannot get into the ship for exports and imports. Think about the migrants who can go to places to pick up the harvest. Think about the people who cannot migrate because of the climate. And so, so and, and, and they cannot in their land and they cannot move because of the, of the COVID. So all this has created a lot of problems worldwide. We are working with FIO, World Food Program and others to mitigate the food crisis that is coming up. Remember that most people die for food-related issues than coronavirus, dengue, and malaria combined. And this has exacerbated that. So this is the time to guarantee a food, a food security in terms of the new agricultural system related to justice. Uh, and we are, um, we are collaborating on the field because the Catholic Church has a lot to, to do in here. Maybe Christine wants to expand on that. And then finally, the how to, I'm framing it with these three words that the Pope loves, that is techo, tierra y trabajo, is land, labor, and livelihood. To think about what are the things that can accelerate the change, that can, that can scale it up also. One is finance. So we are, um, launch, we have just launched a program with UNDP 
on training people in the south on impact investing. We are trying to help uh, lots of uh, investment industries to move towards sustainable investing. Um, the same with the, with, the, with the land I already mentioned some, but the same with the design of, uh, of buildings and the, or the design of the techo no? and of the livelihood using new technologies. How can this be an opportunity to redesign the future or to prepare the future? which is different from preparing for the future. Preparing for the future means that we are, the future is set, it will be terrible, we don't have anything to do, let's the, the ones who can afford it and the ones who cannot, is the titanic rule, no? The titanic. Whereas preparing the future means we are agents of our own destiny. If we empower people using new technology, if we transmit new technology, if we reduce the debt, uh, in order to to transfer the technology to the ones who can to the poor, then all these things are possible. These are uh, because at the end we want to, to aspire to to have healthy people, healthy institutions, and healthy. Health. I think I'm running out of time. Am I right? So, so I, I'm I'm passing over to you, Silvia. Uh, Tim, can you? Thank you. Yeah, you do have two minutes. Hi there. I'm just coming in to ask Celia if she wouldn't mind closing any other windows on her computer, anything else that's open, because we're getting some feedback from your microphone. I'll give you a second to just check that, and then I'll switch your microphone back on. Hi, Celia, you're back on now. Well, it looks like we're waiting for Celia to reconnect. In the meantime, uh, thank you very much, Father Augusto. Uh, my name's Tim, I'm an assistant at the Institute, but I wonder if I could hand over now to Christine Allen from CAFOD to present uh, our next section. Christine, over to you. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks very much to everyone, Celia, and, uh, as well at the Loud RTC Institute for having me tonight. It is mildly terrifying kind of sharing a panel with Father Augusto because he's he's so brilliant and uh, and obviously with the CAFOD connection as well, it's, it's great. Um, I want to share with you just a few very practical things about what CAFOD's doing both in response to the um, coronavirus, but also building on our work and our own reflections in on Laudato C in terms of moving forward. So I'm going to share my screen at some point, but not just yet. But it is important to remember that coronavirus has thrown every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives into chaos. And how many how many of us have felt the, the experience and felt the impact of it in so many different ways? And I think we kind of have to recognize that grief and feeling and uh, my mum would say discombobulation that we all feel by this, whether it be from working from home, from losing friends and colleagues, or just feeling vulnerable and afraid. And I think that's where the, the church has something really deep and our spirituality has something really deep about recognizing us as human beings, as, as vulnerable and as weak and as a bit frightened. So we are, to some extent, like those disciples in that upper room that night, you know, having lost Jesus, they were locked the door because they were frightened and afraid, but the Holy Spirit came down on them. And that's what we have to remember and continue to pray for. And of course, both globally and at home, the coronavirus has thrown into sharp relief the injustices and inequalities that were already present in our societies. Here in the UK, whether it's the disproportionate impact on people from black and minority ethnic communities, through to the increase of poverty and the exponential use of food banks. We experience that at home, but that's replicated globally too. 
Around the world, the World Bank estimates that COVID-19 could push between 70 and 100 million people into extreme poverty this year alone, and a further 176 million into poverty, just, you know, just the next level up. So we're starting to look at the massive implications of that. And as Father Augusto highlighted, food and food distribution is really critical, not just direct distribution at a local level, but the food system. And I think the fact that we're seeing the similarities between what is happening here at home and what is happening around the world brings home to us that sense of we are one family, one world, one community. And obviously, we recognise that some people have more of a safety net than others. And um, CAFOD, has been a, CAFOD is one of those <clears throat> little safety nets, I think, for many people around the world by our work so forgive the plug for just one moment by our work around the world supporting local partner experts who were very often caritas church-based agencies uh, and also other local organizations from other faiths and non we're working together to support them to prevent coronavirus from devastating the most vulnerable communities so i'm gonna share my screen and share a couple of slides oh no where's it gone it was there can you see that? No, that's it. Right. Can you see that now? Is that okay now? Because I can't actually see you. So um, we, this is we we launched an appeal um, recently to to respond to this. So what are we doing? A global it's a global COVID nineteen response that is local in outreach and solidarity. So it's combining the global and the local. So these, I'm going to give you just three very small indications. So from the top, that picture is of Caritas Jerusalem. In the West Bank, our partner Caritas Jerusalem has been delivering much needed food and basic hygiene parcels to a variety of families. That middle picture is Central Alame in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a long-standing CAFOD partner that supports women affected by physical and sexual violence in that country. Uh, I went to visit them last year. It was incredibly moving. But here they've, they've transformed their work and the women are making masks and other protective equipment for visitors to the centre. And it's an example of how many of our partners have adapted their work and adapted their their um, response in order to recognize the need that exists in the context of coronavirus. And that bottom picture is of staff from the Handmaid's Catholic Health Clinic in Sierra Leone proudly um, demonstrating their PPE. Um, but it was also a particular instance where they had had a, a training session on coronavirus with faith leaders, um, people from the World Health Organization, and also CAFOD staff. And equipped with the guidance that it was very much about sending out um, trainers and uh, local community activists to raise awareness of coronavirus and what to do through both sermons and masses, as well as local community engagements. There's lots more illustrations of our practical support that I could show you, but that isn't the purpose of tonight. But just to show you know, we're supporting more than 210 projects in with 155 partners in more than 31 countries around the world tonight. But it's not just practical help. We've been engaging, as um, Father Augusto commented on, the importance of politics and politics policies. We've been engaging with the government and donors, calling on them to provide urgent financial and technical support to help developing countries to cope with this crisis. We've been calling for fairer access to vaccines and we've been flagging up what's been needed to rebuild a fairer, more just society after this crisis. And our current uh, action is a call to cancel the debt payments by developing countries. And we've been working with others on this and had some limited success with the World Bank and finance ministers, but we are keeping up the pressure. The need for political work and influencing in order to change policies is so vital this year more than ever. And poverty isn't an accident, as we know. It's the result of policies and the way in which our society is organised. And in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis is really clear that it's a challenge to politicians, not just us as individuals. And here in this year coming together, faiths are 
this is a picture from last year in our, in our climate lobby, but we will be working with faiths coming together on climate justice. And I think we've got that great roadmap from Pope Francis in, in Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Pope Francis reminds us of the need for our economy to work for the flourishing of all and a more just and equal sharing of the Earth's resources. He reminds us of our interconnectedness and the interconnectedness of issues. And in Fratelli Tutti, he uses that parable of the, of the Good Samaritan, uh, which builds on the Laudato Si culture of encounter, but the Good Samaritan asking us to be, to be different, to stop, to take time and become a neighbor to those despised and excluded. But of course, we've got to build a system not just that embeds that love and kindness, not just individual actions. And so um, we've been supporting the, the Vatican Commission as well. I want to share a little bit about Capod's own journey over the last couple of years, particularly as we've reflected on Laudato Si and what it means for us in our work, in the hope that, that there are some practical illustrations there in the way in which we might be able to, as a society, respond to the coronavirus crisis. We have um, we spent quite a long time, including time with Father Augusto's help, reflecting on how we live out the challenge of Laudato Si. And when, when we read, when, in reading Fratelli Tutti, it's clear that that's as relevant as ever. Uh, so in, this is our strategy, our common home, and there are four commitments that you can see in the middle. And I want to just reflect on what these mean for us and how we operate, because I think these are four really vital building blocks to any action, concrete action, to respond to the, to build back more uh, fairly and equally. The first one across the top is that we ensure positive impacts for people and communities and the environment. The connectivity between people, communities and the environment is critical. And for us, it's about focusing on the most vulnerable and ensuring that we're addressing the causes of poverty and the systems that keep people poor. It's combining the practical and the political. And so and Pope Francis has that phrase, integral ecology, that sense of recognizing our own place within creation and our own responsibility in a complex ecosystem of injustice. How can we do that? But we do it with the desire to bring real benefits to people, communities and the environment. It's the, the poorest of all. The second element, the second plank is about hearing and amplifying the voices of those in need. For us, this is local agency voice and leadership. It's not about us. Um, it is about the people we serve and it's about their voices and their agenda. It is about the fact that those who are poor see the world in a different light to those with money and power. Uh, it could be liberation theology, it could be the preferential option for the poor, but it's become very evident in our society as we've looked at the Black Lives Matter experience over the last six months particularly, that we have to see the world differently. And as Pope Francis calls us, it's our lack of seeing the world from the perspective of the poor that makes the difference. So any policies have to be based on it's who controls the issue, who controls the agenda. In CAFOD, for us, it's about how are we supporting, not controlling our partners, how are we shifting the power? So it's enabling our partners so much more to have that power, it's not contained within us. And linked to this is recognizing and promoting the leadership of people, especially women in communities. For too long, it's the white male voices that have, have had all the power and that really has to change. And we're being called to change. That third plank is a culture of encounter. Each of these are talks in and of themselves, but this culture of encounter is so critical. For CAFOD, we're a partnership-based model, so it's how do we deepen our relationships with our partners? How do we really build that common humanity? But in broader politics, we see it's very easy to ignore, reject, or other, or even demonize people if you don't know them. You know, the, the faceless migrants uh, that, that our Home Secretary loves um, to, to talk about that swamp our, our country, which is rubbish. If we know people, we know and we see our common humanity and we don't blame them. We, without blame, we can focus on solutions. So I think it's about, for us, it's about how do we deepen our relationships with our partners, but it's also how can we be more creative in engaging with the, the whole diversity of the Catholic community in England and Wales as we go forward. 
And it's about also us trans transforming our own institutions, particularly on issues of power in relation to women, people of colour and vulnerable people and children in particular. And finally, my fourth plank, our fourth commitment and our fourth plank I'm is that... I'm going to have to intervene here and ask you just to say half a sentence because we're on time. Oh, sorry. Um, so it is that ecological conversion. It's about us walking the talk and doing it ourselves. So that's what we do. And that's what we would want to call on politicians to do, too. I think these four elements are really critical pathways to how we can rebuild our world after coronavirus. But actually, as Father Augusto has said, the challenge starts now. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And thank you also, Father Augusto, and I'm so sorry that um, we've had these technical issues. It's the first time we've used this platform um, live. So, uh, but I don't want to dig into your time. We've now got the chance for both you and, and Christine to have a, an exchange. Both absolutely fascinating talks about preparing the future. I love the part on food. I have all sorts of questions, but I'm going to restrain myself and let you carry on. Thank you. So I guess we're both agreeing quite a lot, aren't we? So is the, do you think there's any areas of, of dispute, Father Augusto, or are we not going far enough as CAFOD? What, what do you think? No, I think um, everybody, the, the COVID-19 Commission has pushed us to, to intervene. I mean, Laudato Si says, no wisdom can be left out. Fratelli, in Fratelli Tutti, the Pope says, we cannot ignore the voices of the people. Uh, and that means that everybody has to participate. It has to be involved, uh, not just involved in our small community, in small family, small parish, but also in the wider community. And this is one of the highest expression of love. And I would love to bang on on this message because many Christians, they still believe that being a good Christian is being just to love the ones who are surrounding me. And then we live in a schizophrenic spirituality. And then business is business. Well, this is not true. And we can do a great deal of good in business. We can do a great deal of good in, in, in the, the, social, the civic society and in politics, in the pol broader political spectrum. And I think Hartford is doing its best with the resources, because all resources are now shrinking, aren't they? But uh, I would like to to question about the food, because how can we link, how can we really, really mitigate why we discover a vaccine and treatments, etc. I am really, really worried about food. We are talking about millions of people, and we are talking about children going to bed without anything to eat. And we cannot depend on charity in the old sense of the word, like giving food. Because the charity has to be, again, the highest person of charity has to be a new agricultural system. So what do you think, what, what are you doing about that, Christine? And what can we do from the Vatican or more than, what do you think? I, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think what we see is that at the very local level, so much work of our partners has been translated into basically food distribution and keeping people alive. We've seen a huge shift in that. Um, and therefore, from our perspective, from our, from our global advocacy, we're moving into having a much more kind of stronger global advocacy campaign uh, next year. And that is going to be focused around food. It is absolutely about making sure that um, food is the entry point to be able to talk about sustainability and the climate, because obviously lots of issues in relation to carbon emissions come out of intensive agriculture systems. But it's also the system of getting of getting food, the 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 way in which um, it's limited in terms of its access and the nature of that. So uh, watch this space for more work on food. So it really, I was so pleased to see that in your presentation because I thought, yay, we're actually we're on the right track which is great so we'll we'll come back and work with you on that definitely great but, the, but it's also related to health because i remember if we if we don't eat we cannot be <laughs> there's no health whatsoever that we and uh, so water and food especially is related to to health to the development of the person and to the community for some reason from the christian tradition we i mean look at around the table and on sharing the bread we, we celebrate our main, um, or the core of our faith. 
And, and that means that if we cannot share the bread globally, we are failing also somehow. Um, um, because it's about health communities and healthy people to, to ensure, it's about local also, how to ensure that we, we eat more locally because, and, and to change attitudes and, 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 and habits that, that is not easy. Uh, what, what can we, anything that we can help uh, as Christian communities or as a church to promote this change? What, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think that's something that we're working on. But I think you're right to be looking with the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. I think it's I think it's a really important issue about about affecting politics and policies. And, mm. and I do think it's um, f first of all, as you're you're right, it's about who grows our food. And actually, there's you know there's 500 million smallholder farmers in on on this planet that actually are, are feeding the vast majority of people, particularly in Africa and Latin America and Asia. Um, and yet, for a small number of us, it's extremely kind of industrialized. And, and we know that some you know, major governments and donors are actually focused on moving away from smallholder farmers and moving towards the putting more investment in the, the, the big and industrialized side of things. And for us, that's a very important sort of point of advocacy that don't forget smallholder farmers, actually support them more and enable that and create more co-ops and, and that kind of and issues. So there's, there's a lot that can be done. But I want to come back to politics because, you know, we always have that whole thing about, you know, um, uh, religion and politics never mixing. And actually, you know, what was so powerful in Fratelli Tutti is, is Pope Francis saying us as individuals, yeah, be our acts of kindness but actually he's throwing down such a challenge to our societies and to the very nature of our politics um it is in, it is incredible um i mean obviously he's got a obviously the holy spirit worked last weekend but you know let's just uh, i think there's so much more to be to be taking this into the political uh, that is not party politics but it is actually about how our systems and how our societies are organized and one sentence i can add to to your comment um, that the Pope mentioned in, in his catechesis, in the summer catechesis on COVID and how to heal the world, explaining the principle, the Catholic social principle of subsidiarity. He was saying that, and then in Fratelli Tutti, he explains it, no? he, that the subsidiarity has to be, well, top down and bottom up, it's, it's both. No? So to empower people and, and, and enable people to, to contribute to society, which means to reduce inequality, all kinds of inequality, education, race, uh, you name it, uh, economic, but also to ensure you know, from, from, the, from the top that the, that the bottom can, or to assist, or to supply when we cannot, to subside. No? Uh, and in Fratelli Tutti he says, because this is applies to food, to the vaccine, and to energy that I was mentioning. So it's localization or local activity with a with globalization or globalization but with a local flavor because if we're talking about food we it's true that we some countries if, they, if there's no trade on food well they will struggle but but how can we ensure that that is that, that is that is done in the in, in a fair way in a just way uh, so a, a globalization with a local flavor i think that's the, pol the new geopolitical multilateralism that we need and, and, we, and, 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 and some people, I mean, my passion is that every single thing that we can do counts. This is not something that we have, le we have to leave to the UN guys. Or to the, we can do, because if the globalization has a local flavor, any, anything that we do in our community helps to heal the world or not. And the, the church is a global institution as well, you know, as you said, you know, between the Caritas network operating in, in over 160 countries, it's key. But for me, that's why the second plank of the voice and agency of people is so is so critical for us. And it is about who sets the agenda, who's who has the power. And for us, you know, localization in a development sort of terminology is about um, no longer it being about the the traditional kind of you know in big international NGOs you know taking over the control it is very much about how can we support local organizations doing their thing having their voice heard influencing 
through their own ways. And I think that's tied in with the basic construct around equality. It's about tackling the racism and colonialism that's absolutely rife throughout the international development sector, throughout our own society. And, you know, that, that when that it's who has the power. And it's, it's really vital that we set ourselves on that track, that the voice and agency of local people is absolutely valued and recognized and is is it's not um and that we recognize that it's it's not um for in terms of really bringing about the kind of change that we that we need to see and may i ask I'm you I'm sorry. There, sorry um and just say that um you know, we could go on for another hour i'm quite sure and um, I think this uh, focused on um, sort of regenerative forms of agriculture and, and food production is really important because there's another aspect to it as well, which is that regenerative ag agriculture has is a much greater carbon sink. So it so helps solve the climate crisis at the same time. So there are all sorts of reasons. And I'm pleased to say that we are having a th theme of um, agriculture and land ethics uh, at the Institute um, in ne next, not this academic year, but next academic year. So. A lot of excitement to come, I'm sure. So well, I'm going to get straight to the um, some of the questions. Um, so one question that's been popular in here is, I've heard of threats of food wars and food migration. How can we ensure peace and security? So any comments from either of the panelists? And I'm so sorry about the feedback earlier. Um, but anyway, let's, let's carry on. <laughs> one, one sentence. There's no way of achieving peace without development. I mean, the, the Pope, the, the six said that in Populum Progressio. I mean, the new de name of peace is development. Okay. Development understood not as material development of uh, an ending material growth that is destroying the planet. Development understood holistically and, and, and in a just way. Development for all the person and for all people. But there's no way that we can have peace without that because and there's no way, if, you're worried, if we are worried about migration now, you have to wait and see. Then millions, of, we, are, we are expecting millions and millions of people migrating due to climate issues and now connecting with health issues because COVID will not be the last pandemic if we keep destroying the natural world. So if, we're, if, we, if we want to, to help this issue, we need to ensure that we develop all in a just way because otherwise there's no, there's no way that we can have peace. And, and the other side of the coin, look at the conflict areas and conflict zones. There's no way that we can help. Development agencies cannot reach out there because where there's conflict, there's extreme poverty. There's no food, there's no vaccine, there's no health, there's no anything. So it's, it's, it's a double way. So we cannot have a healthy planet uh, without peace, but we cannot have peace without a new model of development. It has to be changed radically. I have to say this because otherwise we are talking it's not just a trick over here and there about the development model now. It has to be changed radically. And this is why we need everybody on board. Yes, I think this leads into this another question as well, um, which is given the development project has been severely criticized for its complicity in impoverishing communities and racializing spaces, how do you think Chris? Christian development agencies can witness differently amidst this criticism? I think that's a question for you, Christine. Yeah, and I think it's definitely something that we're, we're taking incredibly seriously. And I mean, I think that it comes down to the fact that um, we are in a position whereby we in CAFOD are, are thinking about and, and taking actions in order to try to be a much more uh, more of an ally, if you like, rather than a kind of controller, and that's and and to be um, an anti-racist organisation, not just a kind of um, a development organisation. And I think it is about the starting point is about recognition, it is about understanding, but I think it's about recognising power and inequality, and that's why when I was saying in. in in, in our four pillars and our four planks, the voice and agency is whose voice is heard. It's about, it's about our role is to support and to stand alongside and to be in solidarity with people who are, as, as Paul VI said, artisans of their own destiny. You know, that is what that is our model. And I've seen, I've been around the development world for long enough to see how much is, is changing. 
especially from some of the bigger NGOs who talk of talked par partnership, but who've never delivered partnership. And it's the one thing I have to say that I'm so proud of CAFOD because it is absolutely, it's got an level of integrity around its delivery um, because, it, because it is working alongside you know, it's it's very much focused on it's the partners that do that work. It's those local agencies, those local organizations, the local Caritas agencies that are owned by local people. They are run. So our development, it's not it's not our development. Our programs are about supporting local action. So it's locally owned, locally determined and locally delivered. And we stand alongside that. And I think there's something deeply theological there about us knowing our place alongside, standing alongside, being the Good Samaritan, if you like, but not taking over anymore. Yeah, that's a brilliant answer. And I have to say that, Christine, I witnessed that um, live, as it were, you know, 10 years ago when I worked with CAFOD and it actually was transformation transformative for me as an academic so thank you for that so the question now from for father augusto you mentioned you mentioned the ethical way of getting and distributing vaccines with the world just thrilled to have a vaccine what's happening globally to ensure we push for the ethical way well first of all although i'm not a scientist and i cannot talk about the scientific dimension of the vaccine we have to be careful with the news here because one company saying, I have a vaccine that works, doesn't mean anything. It's like, I mean, it's like uh, you, Celia, in your institution saying, we have a paper that is wonderful. Well, show me a peer review. And that's exactly what happens in the, in the, in the world in terms of vaccine. There's a collective group on the vaccine in terms of transparency that they are, there, there, there are more than 40, there are around 47 vaccines in trial and 150-ish in pre-trial, there are three lines of vaccine. There's no way of saying this vaccine works now because they have just a couple of young people that are, and, and it has worked in young, healthy people. The, I mean, vaccine development normally takes a lot of time. It normally takes five years, and we are doing that in less than one year for record time. But we have to be very, very careful in announcements of one, one company without any peer review of the others. For some reason, they are there are organisms in place to certify that this is working or not. The same as you will do with your paper, no? with a peer review. The same with a development agency. We have a wonderful program. Oh, how do you know? Well, <laughs> but if others say, yes, this is a wonderful program, this is okay. So first of all, we need to come down with the news that are around this week. Secondly, we have to think, can a vaccine really get universal vaccination or not i my fear is that we can and I, my fear is that we need different types of vaccine on going on to reach everybody because the problem is again we have to to vaccinate at least 70 percent of the population that's millions and millions and millions of people and that have, and, and we cannot create millions and millions and millions of vaccine distributed and implemented because implementing the vaccine is about trust so this is a complex issue uh, that we have to be very careful with it because with the techno fix mentality, Celia, this thing that we work together with Celia a couple of years, by the way, both Celia and myself, we work for CAFO, so CAFO is very good at training theologians down, <laughs> uh, to bring them down to earth. No? <laughs> so, so, but the techno fix mentality is still in our mind. This is not other people. You see, ah, the vaccine, the, the COVID is over. No, no, because COVID is not just about vaccine, it's about health treatment. It's about water, it's about food, it's about sanitation, it's about commerce, it's about economics. Latin America, or the, the continent where I'm coming from, Latin America is, is, is not doing well at all because of the COVID. I mean, please don't think that because one company announced that we have one test that has worked, we are, we are done. This is, next year will be really, really complex and we still have to do all these radical changes needed in order to have a healthy planet in the future. Otherwise, it will be a techno fix, but it won't work. Yeah. And if, if I could agree with you, and actually we're now out of time. So um, I say these are questions from the floor. So Christine, would you like to just have one quick sentence on that? Well, I was just going to say, there's a lot of experience of, of, of NGOs working on vaccines that, that really needs to be drawn on. And uh, there's a there's a big uh, kind of consortium and, and, a, and a, a 
a process that that because we're already involved in in vaccines as as the international development sector in terms of uh, spreading them out, and we know how how much um, you know work has has been taken. So I I think we've been as CAFOD uh, lobbying uh, the British government to make sure that where there's any um, British investment in a vaccine that it's it, that it's made sure that they require it to be to be fairly accessed but there's a there's a huge that as as father augusto said there's a real complexity around um getting getting vaccines out so there's a lot of lessons learned that we can draw on from from what we've what we're doing in in the in the past this has been a, a brilliant conversation i'm sorry about a few technical glitches at the beginning so i just wanted to make a last word of thanks to both of you for for taking time and it's been a really exciting dialogue and I wish it could go on forever, well, longer at least. Um, so thank you so much. Next week we're having another dialogue, so please tune in, those of you who have signed up this week um, on the 19th of November, 1700. Um, I have to say a personal note, today's it's my daughter's birthday, she's 20 today, so a, a fitting <laughs> a memorial for her. Well, not quite memorial, but celebration perhaps. So I'm going to turn next. So thank you both of you once again and Look forward to uh, some of you at least joining us next week. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Thank yeah. you, Christine. Thank you. Bless. Good to see you, Augusto. Take care. Thanks, Thank Celia. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.